Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, oh, I'll feel. Tonight we're in Psalms 23. And uh, just to recap, because it's one verse, we might as well, right? Amen. I mean, we might as well keep it in context. And so starting in 23.1, um, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I asked David last night, I said, were you able to get to the shepherd part last night? <laughs> you know, and he said, yes, the Lord is my shepherd. Amen. Amen. So uh, I hope that was established in you last night. I hope before you went home, if he wasn't your shepherd, he became your shepherd. But if not, we hope that he becomes your shepherd tonight before we leave this place. Amen. But tonight I've been given the task of, of, of verse 2. Now, I want to tell you when you're, when you're given one verse to preach, that can be difficult for a preacher, okay? Especially when it's a short verse. Not because he has trouble finding stuff to say. But he has trouble finding when to cut it off. <laughs> because you would think one little verse, how much can be in a little verse, you know? I want to tell you, we're going to be here a little bit, all right? So, but we're going to read it real quick. And it says, uh, he makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leadeth me beside still waters. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it ministers to us because it represents you jesus you are the word so tonight when we read it when we preach it when we teach it when we take it in we are absorbing you tonight yes. speak to us holy spirit lead us in jesus name amen, amen. now a few things i want to first, first of all I want to tackle the we're going to split this in half okay so the first half is he makes me lie down in green pastures now a few things are going on here first of all David is speaking from experience. <laughs> Amen. I mean, he's speaking from experience. I mean, he had been keeping sheep since he was a little boy. Come on. I mean, when, when Samuel comes to get him, he's out in the field tending the sheep for daddy. All right. So he's speaking from experience. He knows what it is to be a shepherd. When you do a little bit of research in the scripture, you're going to find that God picked a lot of people to be leaders who were shepherds. There's just something about a shepherd, the leadership skills that they have. And so David knows what to do. He knows what a shepherd does. So his first thing is he's, he's coming from experience. So for David to write this down, it's not just anybody writing it down. Come on. Amen. I mean, if, if, if someone is skilled in an area and they begin to talk about that area, you pay attention, right? Amen. We all go to hear people speak at times on the level they're skilled in about something if we're trying to learn it. Amen. When you're pulling up, I mean, I, you may not do YouTube or whatever, but when you try to learn how to do something, what do you do? You Google a YouTube video, you search it, you try to find somebody that knows something about it. You find a bunch of people that don't, <laughs> but eventually you might find somebody. You know, my dad's electrician. When I have electrical questions, I call daddy. Yeah. Amen. Come on. If I had an, uh, a question about some sort of, uh, I don't know, medical equipment, Kelly, I would find somebody to call. But anyway, <laughs> so David's speaking from experience. But then there's something that's happening. You see, all the word of God is given by inspiration. Amen. When, when, when men actually wrote down the scriptures, they weren't just writing something down that sounded good, Roger. They wasn't just writing something down that preached real good, David. They were writing things down inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit has come upon David and he's wrote these passages, written these passages down. And so he's also speaking prophecy. Wait a minute, a prophecy? What do you mean, Brother Brad? Well, I discovered this little nugget over in Mark chapter 6. Flip over there real quick. Won't take but a minute. Mark chapter 6. We were going through this at, when we were doing our uh, a podcast here a while back. David and them invited me to uh, Oklahoma, and we went and spent uh, a weekend in a cabin, and we did about five podcasts. It nearly killed me. But uh, I didn't sleep. <laughs> we ate good, though. I didn't starve to death. But anyway, but, but we had, no, we really had the best time just going through Mark chapter 6. And it was after I got home that I was going to preach a sermon that, that you know, continued uh, some stuff that God was showing me in Mark chapter 6. And I found this little nugget. Amen. I, got, I guess I need to get there if we're going to get there tonight. 
Mark chapter 6, verse 30. Let's read right here. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things both they had done and what they had taught. Now they had gone out. Jesus had sent them out, and now they've come back, okay? And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into the, 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 the desert place and rest a while. Most of us would be looking for a desert place. But <clears throat> for there were many coming and going, and they had no, no leisure as even much time to eat. So they couldn't have dessert because they hadn't eaten yet. And they departed into the desert place by the ship privately. So there's water nearby, amen, catching that? And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot there out of the cities, and out went them, and they came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion towards them, because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Wow, some familiarity here. And when the day was not far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, said it, this is a, a desert place and now it's time to, time is far past send them away that they may go into the country round about and to the villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat so the day has gone on and they you know they're getting hungry and the disciples are questioning and then jesus says he answered and said unto them give them to eat give you them to eat and they said unto him shall we go buy 200 pennies worth of bread and give them to eat and he said unto them how many loaves do you have Go and see. And when they knew, they said five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all set down by companies upon the green grass. <laughs> now, when I hit this, I was like, wow. We didn't catch this in our little deal when we were doing our podcast. This would be an add-on. But I was just like, the shepherd set them on the green grass. It don't get any better than that, Kelly. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's pretty much Scripture coming to pass. Amen? And he set them down by ranks by 100 and by 50s. Now, there, here's another little free nugget here. Because when you look at Psalms 152, the same verse 2 in Psalms 150, it says, praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Jesus is about to do a mighty act <laughs> before them. He's about to feed 5,000 folks. Okay? That's what a shepherd can do. He's going to take care of his sheep. He saw his sheep. He saw them in need. And he said, you know what? I'm going to take care of them. So, so first thing, David speaks from experience. Next, he's writing some things that are, that are prophecy that actually has been fulfilled through, through that. But then there's more prophecy that takes place. Because David is also speaking of a rest that Christ would bring through the cross, even one that's still to come. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 10, 12 says this. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it for you. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of the Father. He sat down and he rested. Jesus has rested Concerning your sin. Think about it. Amen. It's finished. Hallelujah. He's rested. But then in Hebrews 4, let's flip there real quick. Won't take us long. See, it was a trick. I told you we was doing one verse tonight. It's a setup. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> I'll give you a second to get there. I use this iPad because I can go really quick and also I can blow it up. But today I got, I got bifocal contact. So I'm like, whoa, <laughs> it's jumping off the page at me. Amen. Hallelujah. I can see clearly now. Anyway, all right. So it's all right to have fun, everybody. Amen. There was, there was pages flipping. We had time. So Hebrews 4, 1. Let us therefore fear, fear lest with promise, least a promise being left us of entering into the rest any of you should seem to come short of it don't want to come short of it right for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them but the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it for we which have believed do enter into rest as he has said so there is a rest amen come on i mean we're not working 
we're not working to get to heaven anymore. Okay, we're not working to be in relationship. In other words, our, our relationship with him is not dependent, Kelly, on our works any longer. So there is a rest, amen? But then he goes on to say, as he said, as I have sworn into my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Because, so basically because he finished it, now catch this, from the foundation of the world. So you thought it was finished on the cross. Come on. It was finished way before the cross. Come on. It was finished in the garden. Amen. Hallelujah. It was done because he, he had committed to, to do it. Amen. Verse 4, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on the wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if thou shalt enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they who, whom is first preached enter not in because of unbelief. So the first ones that heard it didn't believe. Again, he limited a certain day, saying, and David, here's David again, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice and harden not your hearts, for if Jesus had given them rest, they would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remaineth, therefore, a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into the rest he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. So we've seen here that David has spoke of a rest that he has described based on a shepherd's point of view. He has spoke, spoken of rest that was prophetic, that actually took place in another passage in Scripture and Jesus fulfilled it. Come on. But he also spoke of prophecy of what Jesus would do in fulfilling that rest and what he did on the cross. And guess what? There's coming a day. There's coming a day. You won't need this tent anymore. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Was here about, I don't know, a month or so ago. Right. A dear co-worker was laid to rest. His body was laid to rest out here. He's not there. Amen. Amen. But his body was laid to rest right out here in the cemetery in front. Amen. So we know that there. There's rest described here, but here's my problem, David, is people have heard the word rest and they've interchanged that with sleep. <laughs> Come on. He's make, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He's wanting you to rest, but he didn't say go to sleep. Come on. Amen. I mean... And what's happened is I've seen is the church has settled into a place of comfort and they've gotten comfortable in the, in the provision of God. They've gotten comfortable in this place of, hey, everything here is, I've got grace working in my life, Brother Kelly, and everything's pretty good and, 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 and I'm blessed and, and, and nothing wrong with that. But we've slipped off into a comatose sleep, amen? Come on. Here a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, I... I, I woke up in the morning and, and with my mind on, oh, anyway, so I woke up in the morning and uh, you got to watch me. I'll just start singing, preaching. You just got to watch me. But I, I woke up and I was, I was, I was awake and I was laying there and I thought, I thought, well, I need to get on up. I got some stuff I need to do. And then I was like, it's Saturday, Roger. It's Saturday and I don't really got anything I got to do. And I thought, well, I'll just lay here and rest, you know? Now, I had thought I had slept good the night before, and I didn't feel tired, Mylon. I didn't feel tired, you know, but I thought I'd just lay here and rest. And then I was slain in the spirit all of a sudden. <laughs> in other words, I, I fell off to sleep, and I was dead to the world. You know what I'm talking about? Roger, I'm talking about sawing timbers, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm talking about I was out, and my wife comes over, and she says, wake up, you know. And I was like, I didn't even realize I was, I was that tired. I didn't even realize it. You know, the church hasn't really realized we've been asleep. He brought us and set us on green pastures and said, hey, rest here a little while. And we just down for the count. You know, I'm sure the 5,000, brother, I'm sure the 5,000 would have loved to just hung out there for breakfast. Yeah. Amen. Just hang out here until breakfast comes, you know. 
But here's the problem with the, with the, the rest becoming sleep is the second half of this verse. See, we run up on the second half of this verse. Let's read that now. Because the second half says, He leads me besides still water. Or he leadeth me besides still water. He leadeth. The word leadeth there is, is Nahal. I looked it up. And it means something. And by the way, the word leadeth here is a little different than the one the next verse here was preaching tomorrow night. Just a little clue there. So, a little nugget. But... He says that, or the word means that to conduct, to conduct, okay? He leadeth me. He conducts. And actually, the emphasis, if you look this up, is by interference, okay? By interference. In other words, he's leading you by interfering in things to lead you okay and here's the here's the neat little analogy or a little idea the lord put in my in my brain because I, I like music okay now so because i like music i went i grew up and went to band and I, I wanted to play the drums and be like cool like mylon and play the drums and stuff but when i got in there there's about 14 drummers and they said we can't have 14 snare drums out there on the field you know when there was only 25 people in the band <laughs> you know so they said, you're going to have to play something else. And my daddy, he, he's like, well, son, what are you going to play? And I wasn't going to play no trumpet. Uh, I wasn't going to play no trombone, that's for sure. Wasn't going to play no French horn. So we settled on the saxophone. And we didn't have a tenor sax. We had alto saxes. And I was just, you know, I mean, when you're used to hearing yakety sax play or something like that, and then you get an alto sax, it just ain't the same, you know, unless you're Kenny G or somebody like that. But anyway, so I... I got in there nonetheless and started learning a little bit. And the first thing we had to learn how to do is follow the conductor, follow the band director. Come on, we call them band directors, okay? In church, we call them song leaders, right? <laughs> song leaders. And so he had his little baton, you know, and he would, you know, he would tap it to get everybody's attention. And that usually meant we're about to start something, Okay. And as he would get us all together, then he would begin to, to start, and his hands would come up. Now, hold on, i got to do this properly, because I actually YouTube this today, that you put it this way, you fold the thumb, finger, there we go. There we go. Like Just like that, okay? And, you know, and they would do the timing, you know, the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, except nobody does three-quarter timing much anymore. So, you know, then it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, you know, and then there's six, eight. Don't ask me how to do that one. Okay. But, and there's expression now, you know, some band directors can be boring. I mean, some song leaders can be boring. I, I'm, not, I'm not throwing no stones. I'm just saying sometimes, you know, it could be. But a real conductor if you go see a hundred piece orchestra, there's about a hundred pieces in, in an orchestra, okay? I mean, you got your strings over here, you got your brass section, you've got your, you know, all your different, you know, your, your percussion. I mean, they got a percussion section, you know? I mean, they got one guy that's got three or four big old drums all to himself, you know? I mean, they got it going on. They fill up an entire stage and they sound awesome, Dwayne, when they're warming up. I mean, you know, you're just like, whoo, man, they ain't even played nothing yet, you know? You may not be into all this. I'm sorry. If you'd rather be fishing, I'm sorry. But anyway, but the conductor, as he gets to going, he begins to bring everything together. And he'll get his other hands involved, and he'll get facial expressions involved, and he'll move, and he'll duck, and he'll bend, and he'll be doing all this. And here's the thing is everybody's not playing at once. You see, sometimes he'll be like, hold on, Roger, it's not your turn. Come on. I'm doing something over here. This is the feature right here. And Roger's sitting over there just waiting to play. He's just waiting to play. Give me my, give me my chance. Give me my chance. It'll come. It'll come. But when it comes, he'll, he'll, he'll begin to interfere into Roger's life over here. And he'll say, okay, Roger, now it's time. Come on. Come on. And bring it. And he'll bring that again. And it's an orderly thing 
that God wants to do. He wants to lead us conducting by interference, amen? By beginning to get us to put our eyes on the shepherd, come on. Beginning to put a focus on the shepherd. First of all, understanding that he is my shepherd, as David preached last night. And, that you know, my band director was my band director. We called him my band director. Everybody said, that's my band director. That's, who is that? That's my band director. That's my conductor. That's the one leading. Amen. And as they begin to submit to the one leading, he could take a bunch of jacked up musicians. We wasn't very good at all. They told us, they said, we want to have a marching band. We said, we got like 20 people. It ain't going to be much marching. You know? And so we got together and we had this really cool idea that we would get an electric bass guitar and we would do some jazz band stuff. And man, we brought jazz band to the, to the, the, the ball games and we'd sit out there and during halftime we couldn't march, but we'd do jazz, you know? You know, you know, and we'd do stuff like that, and, and it was really cool. But we had to watch him. We had to pay attention. We had to do it in his timing because guess what? If you didn't, it would stink. If you miss your cue, if you're not following the shepherd, if you're not being led by him, it gets off. It gets out of sync. It gets out of order. I heard somebody say, when you're out of order, you're out of power. <laughs> Amen, you know? Because there's a reason that he's working it all together. There's a reason that he is interfering in your life. See, most people, they don't want God interfering. God, I want you to be my shepherd, but don't interfere with what I got going on. It's not possible. How can a conductor conduct a hundred-piece orchestra if his back's to him? As he begins to make eye contact with them. You know, they say those, those really good orchestra musicians, they read the eyes. I mean, they know when he, they know, I mean, it's like, it's like ball game moves, you know, the, all that stuff. I mean, they, they know exactly what he's meaning. And, you know, and it's, it's beautiful when it comes together. And there's sometimes it's rejoicing. You talk about rejoicing. There's sometimes when God gives a, all his kids together and he gets the body of Christ together and it's full blown. It's the part of the song that everything's coming up a notch and it's da 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 you know. And, man, it's revivals breaking out in the church. Yeah. And then there's times when there's just a solo section and he's got Brother Wes over at a prison ministry somewhere. Come on. Just talking to an inmate. Hallelujah. And it's just a moment where God's leading. Just a little, just a little part. Beautiful little thing here. I want to tell you, it's cool how he leads, but he leads by interference. And if you don't want him interfering, he's not leading. He's not leading. There are some places that we do want his interference. This is the good stuff because this is what the rest of it means. Here are the benefits to God interfering in your life. First of all, the word leadeth is to protect. It's to protect. We want this one. <laughs> Come on, most of us leave the house. Lord, I post your angels to guard about me. Amen. North, south, east, and west. And while I'm gone, protect my guns. <laughs> Amen. No, no, no. Sorry. I'm, we're in the south. I mean, some of you might pray that. I don't know. You know. Lord, don't let them get in my four-wheeler. Anyway, no. We're, we, we post our angels, seriously. We post our angels to protect, right? Do we not? We pray over our kids. They're getting on the school bus. Lord, protect them. Keep them safe. Watch that old bus driver smack him upside the head Lord, no i'm just playing. no uh, but lord protect him exodus 14 14 the lord shall fight for you Amen. and you shall hold your peace i love this one yeah, i love this one because there are times when david i don't have the fight in me now there's some days i'm like lord i got this come on let me let me lord let me let me let me go lord let me get him let me get him don't look at me like that. You do that to us stuff too. 
But no, seriously, there's times I don't have it in me. And so I'm thankful that he's got my back. I'm thankful that the shepherd's looking out, Brother Roger, and, and when he sees something coming out of the woodwork that don't look right, he's like, get back. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. That one's mine. Hallelujah. You missed a good place to shout right there. We want God's interference when it comes to protection, do we not? Sure. Hallelujah. It means to sustain. Psalms 55, 22 says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never, or he shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Sustain. We love it when he takes care of us and gives us everything we need. Amen? I mean, after all, we need a lot. <laughs> Amen? Now, I'm not talking about your wants tonight. We've all got a list of wants. But most of us, our needs are met. If we were to be real here tonight, open and honest, most of us have everything we need. I mean, you could be somebody here in need tonight. I'm not, I'm not going to say you're not, but I'm just saying most of us have everything we need. Why? Because the shepherd sustains us. He took care of the journey already. He planned out where they were going. We're going to go over to this field, and then we're going to go down by that creek. Come on. And I'm going to make sure you got the provision along the way that you need. Now, those sheep didn't load up grass. Come on. And carry bags on their back for the road. Amen? No, because the shepherd knew exactly where to take them, when to take them, how to take them, the safe way to take them. Come on. He sustained them through everything. Praise God he sustains us. Amen? It also means to carry. Isaiah 40, 11 says this. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom. And he shall gently lead those that are with young. He carries his sheep. Amen. Amen. He carries us. I've got a little 18-month-old grandson. And he, uh, he'll say, Papa, Papa. And I'll pick him up and... He'll want me to carry him for a little while, and he'll love on me, and then he'll be on down, <laughs> on down. And see, so that's the way we do God sometimes. God, carry me, carry me. And then he gets us up there, and he's loving on us, and everything's going good. And then we're like, on down. <laughs> I want to go do my thing. And it's not like that. He wants to carry you. He wants to carry you through difficult times. He wants to carry you through joyous times. Amen? I don't just carry my grandson because he can't walk on his own. I carry him because it's part of my relationship and my love towards him. Amen. Now, I'm going to break a little myth here tonight because I already talked to David about this. But, you know, we've been talking about this in a few conversations. Because somewhere along the way, some traditions came out. And, and it was like, well, the shepherd... Now, don't throw no rocks at me now. The shepherd, he'll break the leg of the sheep and he'll wrap that leg up and everything and then he'll carry that sheep on his back until that sheep gets better and then that sheep will mind him. He'll go everywhere he needs to go. I'm going to tell you something, guys. Ladies, that ain't Bible. <laughs> it ain't in there. That's not scriptural. That's a tradition. And it's not even a Jewish tradition. I even looked it up because sometimes you find Jewish traditions. In Jewish tradition, God actually chose, as I said before, the shepherds because of how they cared for their sheep. Their ability to lead their sheep. So I want to tell you something. God's not an abusive shepherd. He ain't abusive. Now I know that's for some folks that's grown up in a time and a season in their life where maybe they've endured some of that and, it, and, and they, they tend to think, well, this is the way maybe my heavenly father's going to correct me. I want to tell you, he don't have to break your leg. Now, now I'm not going to tell you, you might, you might break your leg on your own. You know, you might try to be Roger Rabbit over here and jump some rocks and do something on your own. No pun intended. But anyway. We get in consequences of our actions and our choices. Yeah. Amen? I'm not going to say you're not going to get your leg broke. But I'm going to tell you this. A good shepherd, he cares for his sheep. And a good shepherd, it would make no economical sense whatsoever for him to, <laughs> to break a leg on his sheep. 
It may not, out there in the bush, in the wilderness, it may not heal right. <laughs> I mean, and after all, he can't carry every one of them. They're 75 pounds a piece, you know, or so. I mean, that'd be kind of difficult. It'd be really hard on him to do that. That's not the kind of carrying that God wants to do. God's not going to enable you to keep doing what you're doing. He's going to, but he's going to reach out and get a hold of you and offer his love, his mercy, and his grace and show you, hey, Instead of you doing this on your own and getting these results you're getting, come and have a relationship with me. And if you're not able to go on any farther on your own, I'll carry you. To me, I see that as when we're weary and well-doing. When we've been trucking on and doing and living and, and trying to go forward and we're tired and we're weak and I can't even walk. Without you holding my hand. That's the shepherd I'm describing to you tonight. One that would go, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I got to help this one. Moses, it's said in tradition, because I did read some Hebrew tradition. It's said in tradition that Moses, uh, there's a story in the Hebrew Midrash or however that books, I forget how it's called. But there's a story in there where it said that Moses... Uh, the, a, a lamb gets away from the flock and runs down to the water. And Moses runs down to the water. This is tradition, y'all. Moses runs down to the water and, and, and the, the little lamb's getting a drink. And Moses realizes it's thirsty and he lets it finish getting its drink. And he waits for it to finish drinking. And then he reaches down and he gently picks it up. And he carries it back to the flock. He didn't deny that little one a drink. Come on. He didn't deny it because he's a good shepherd. And I want to tell you, we got a good shepherd tonight. He's leading you. He's leading you. Amen. The last thing that it means is to guide. Psalms 32, 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with my eyes. Isaiah 58, 11 says, And the Lord shall guide thee continually, satisfying thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. I want to tell you something. God wants to lead you by interference because he knows what's best he knows what's best now he'll let you run off for a little bit <laughs> but not for long because he's going to come find you he's going to come find you I grew up in the church was taught the things of God as I became a teenager, I was like, I'm done with this. I got stuff I got to do. I had a rock and roll band. I had to tour the world. <laughs> you know, ask Kelly, he'll tell you. <laughs> but I had things I wanted to do. I had a direction I wanted to go in. And you know what? He let me for a little while. But I'm so thankful tonight. He's the good shepherd. And I'm so thankful tonight that I learned it's so much better to follow the leader. <laughs> I'd rather have green pastures to sit and rest in. I'd rather have the water, of the fresh water of the brook than do it the hard way. I'm so thankful that I'm one that he left the 99 for. And he came and ran over and he found me. And he said, hey, get back over here. <laughs> get back over here. And I, you know, I probably talked back a little bit. Bye, bye, bye. You know, probably talked back a little bit. Talk, I talked back. Yeah. There we go. Da -dum -sh. Make sure that don't get edited out. <laughs> I probably did. You probably did too. But when I realized there was a bigger picture than me, you see, 
Last night we established through what David taught that the Lord is my shepherd. And he is. And it starts out with what's personal. But then you realize there's a purpose in it. Because he's my shepherd. He's David's shepherd. He's Wes's shepherd. And then we realize as he begins to bring it all together. In unison and harmony. There's a plan. And just like a, the most elaborate hundred piece orchestra would be here in this room tonight now i could get these guys up here i started doing illustration but I, I was afraid if i did this they'd do that and you know anyway just kidding but now if we had an elaborate orchestra up here and a conductor a real conductor that knew what he was doing like god knows what he's doing it's amazing it's amazing I've been told that, I'm not a scientist, so I haven't proven this, but I've been told that the galaxies admit a frequency. That with certain instrumentation, you can hear that frequency. And it's been said that when they're listening together, it's like as, as a harmony. It's as different frequencies going off together. That sounds like something God would do. I can just see my shepherd up there with the stars. You know, I can just see it, you know, because that's how awesome he is. He's my conductor. And because he's my conductor, he has the right to interfere in anything he wants to with me. Because ultimately, I trust him. I trust him. And I know he's going to make it good. He's going to make it good. He's going to reflect his glory in it. Just like he wants to do in you tonight. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's read the verse again as we close. I'm going to just do verse 1 and 2. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides still waters. He leadeth me. He leadeth me by his own hands. He Leadeth me, his faithful follower I would be, for by his hands he leadeth.